Good evening, everyone. Can I join my, the previous speakers in paying my respects to the traditional owners of the land and all other Indigenous and Torres Strait Island people who are here tonight? Uh, can I then offer my congratulations to everyone who's been involved in production of what is an absolutely outstanding issue of the University of New South Wales Law Journal? To each of the contributing authors, the editorial board, the executive editor, Dustin Carty, and of course the editor of this issue, Max Jones, who you just heard of. You really should be very proud of all the work you've done in getting this issue to print. Uh, I know the stress that goes through of getting one article, but uh, a journal is impossible. Uh, I should mention, of course, because you want to temper my praise, and I've got a vested interest in this, since I was pleased to discover that one of the authors is a former researcher of mine, I saw early on drinking out of a bottle of beer. She used to drink wine. <laughs> 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 Sorry, Sarah. Uh, I've been asked this evening to offer some of my personal insights into the topic of contemporary professionalism and regulation. Now, I practiced as a barrister in commercial and corporate law for about 35 years before I came to the bench. It was a long time. Probably a lot of people here briefly thought it was too long. I'm pleased to see the back of me. <laughs> but it's no doubt two things are unsurprising in that. First, my relationship with the topic finds most resonance, of course, in the interaction between commercialism and professionalism. And second, I come to it not necessarily from the view of a member of a large law firm, I never was obviously, but from a person who observed it out from the outside, but who interestingly enough saw the same, same pressures put in relation to this area, although probably because we were a one-band one band practice, not with the same commercial difficulties. Now, that, putting it simply, we never advertised like that. <laughs> um, but we did, particularly before taxation reform and fringe benefits tax, uh, have last lunch and uh, entertainment. <laughs> um, I'm not going to say who in this uh, room I entertained, they know, if I, if I ever did. But uh, from those simple days, it's undeniable that as the practice of law and the world of co commerce have increasing complexity and sophistication, so too have challenges to professional ethics. The degree to which the field of professional ethics has advanced over the last century can be seen by looking at the state of the regulatory framework in the early 1990s. There's a fascinating little book by Gleason Archer, who was the original founder of Suffolk University Law School in Massachusetts which purported to be a comprehensive treaty on the subject of ethical obligations of the lawyer, lawyers in 1910. To illustrate the complexity of ethical challenges which confronted a lawyer in those times, Archer's treaty includes a chapter titled, and I quote, Office Not a Lounging Place, <laughs> in which he sternly warned his readers that a law office should not be a lounging place for the attorney's idle friends and acquaintances. <laughs> uh, that's probably true today, and indeed, some of that resonated from the time that I first came to the bar. I remember appearing before a district court judge who wasn't very bright and will remain nameless, <laughs> um, who, who said two things to me. He said, you're slouching in the bar table and your wigs are skew. Um, over, I think, 36, 32, and he talked treated in a very serious manner. Over 36 years, I never broke that habit. <laughs> um, but in instructing on the conditions of office, Archer employed in clause, the office should bear witness to the presence of a studious lawyer. <coughs> books should be in evidence. If the occupant's library is small, he should arrange what books he has in the most imposing array possible. <laughs> <laughs> it's not necessary that all books in the collection be the latest publications. <laughs> shelf fillers are quite as serviceable when the object is to fill up shelf space. <laughs> More books are all alike to the ordinary client, so far as the estimate of value is concerned. <laughs> now, you think that's out of date? These days, young people who go to the bar are confronted with sets of chambers which have got all these uh, shelves. They've got no, re no use for them, they work off the computer and online. So they plead people, sometimes their, their parents, to give them unused law books so they can fill up the shelves to comply with Archer's quote. Now, no doubt there are many corporate lawyers here today who, and I don't say like me, yearn for the days when compliance with their ethical obligations simply involve the rearrangement of their library's law reports, or indeed when they couldn't impress their clients so easily. But in the modern age, 
The rise of commercialism has affected the legal profession, both internally and externally. As law firms have adopted fee models and corporate structures that reflect the market in which they are operating, and as they respond to their clients' call, an increasingly sophisticated call for further integration of the lawyers into the world of business. Unlike in Archer's time, when funneling lawyers into business was, in his words, a way of disposing of the overflow, <laughs> lawyers... I'm oh, sorry, it's true. <laughs> lawyers are now integral players in corporate decision making and in many ways essential to facilitating efficient business operations. This environment of commercial immersions is something Justine Rogers, Dimitri Kingsford Smith and John Shellow discuss in their article on this issue, noting how the corollary of the fact that large law firms, I quote, facilitate almost every acti economic activity and business transaction in society, is that they are also in a special position as ethic gatekeepers with the ability to advise the client against wrongdoing and potentially withhold their cooperation. Now, they talk about large law firms, but can I assure you it's not only the large law firms who face those challenges. Every lawyer is commonly asked for advice on matters which have, com which have interrelated legal and commercial questions. A lawyer cannot in these days isolate him or herself from the commercial consequences or effect of the advice given. Um, I had the privilege, as a sole practitioner, of having a retainer from a number of large corporations, and uh, they don't need to be mentioned, but some of the larger corporations in this country. One of the most interesting retainers I had was to advise not the company, but the board of directors of the company. It was a direct retainer of the board. And as a result of that, I attended board meetings in uh, rooms which I discovered to my surprise was carefully wired to prevent people from eavesdropping from outside. But the interrelation and the importance of the legal aspects of decisions both in this country and things that partly affect them really demonstrated to me in a very serious way how important this interactive interaction is. Now, courts always, I shouldn't say this but I will, uh, courts always lag behind to some extent. But the role of the lawyer as a gatekeeper is something that's been, I think, increasingly recognised by courts as they, wait, wait, they, wait, they find ways to hold lawyers legally accountable for illegal actions of their client. I'll just mention two cases, Asik and Somerville and Saffron and Asik. In Somerville, Asik brought a civil penalty action against Mr Somerville and eight directors of companies advised by him. While the directors consented a declaration of the breach of director's duty, provision of the Corporations Act, Mr. Somervale, through his legal advice, was found to be excess an accessory accessorially liable, I can never use say that word, liable under Section 79 of the Corporations Act. In Saffron, of course, James Hardy's in-house counsel was captured as an officer of the corporation and thus found liable for breach of duty under Section 180 of the Corporations Act. Uh, the fact that Mr. Saffron was both general counsel and company secretary is a perfect example of the increasing overlap between law and business. This entanglement of lawyers and corporate action and the court's willingness to impose liability on advisors in such a position demands that lawyers no longer stand passively by their clients' misdemeanours. As Lee Harut, a prominent New York attorney and later, of course, United States Secretary for War, famously stated, about half the practice of a decent lawyer is telling would-be clients that they're damn fools and they should stop. It's not bad, bad, bad advice sometimes and it's still not bad advice today. But the question of where the line is drawn and what interventionary action is required throws up some very challenging questions. The breadth of the spectrum of possible intervention is evident in the variety of metaphors used to describe the relationship between lawyers and their corporate counsel. In questions of whether lawyers should simply refrain from encouraging unethical behaviour or whether they should act actively dissuade, withdraw or report internally or externally, commentators have asked whether the role of the lawyer should best be described as guardian, gatekeeper, watchdog or whistleblower. But of course, as progressively positive obligations of reporting are imposed on lawyers, the greater the likelihood of, the con con of conflict with their obligation to the client and of course particularly that of confidentiality. Archer advised that a lawyer never loses but gains 
by severing his relations with a client who turns out to be a rascal. Very useful book, actually. <laughs> Unfortunately, this advice was, of course, more effective before competition and consumerism because it became the guiding regulatory force. And it was one advantage of being a commercial barrister, I think. You could always say no because but people would turn up again sooner or later. <laughs> but as Rogers, Kingsford Smith and Cheller discuss, the free market deregulation of the 1980s left its mark on the profession with a distinctive client influence over the meaning of professionalism. When clients were able to shop around for the right legal advice, the ability to deter unethical corporate behaviour is severely weakened. In Hugh Brakey and Charles Sanford's article, they show us how this phenomenon is not confined to the demands of corporate clients, but although also those of powerful employers, including governments. Uh, they, strike one, they cite one of the best uh, well-known examples, and that was Madeleine Albright's exhortation to the United Kingdom government to get new lawyers when they received the first advice concerning the legality of military action in Kosovo. Now, you might say that uh, there might be some advice going around the uh, west wing of the White House at the present time. <laughs> I, probably, I probably shouldn't go there. Um, in Graham Greenleaf's review of Richard, Richard and Daniel Susskind's The Future of the Professions, we see how the influence of competition and client-related legal services may be exacerbated in the future. For instance, what happens to legal professionalism when lawyers are rec rec recruited by Uber-like apps that incorporate user ratings, price comparison and professional <laughs> options? Uh, I can tell you, be like me, don't read them, but maybe that doesn't really work. But as some of the articles in this issue explore, market mechanisms don't always have a deteriorating effect on professional ethics. Hugh Brake, in his article, cites market forces as perhaps the most important example of ambiv ambivalent obstacles or supports. Clients can either vote with their feet and their wallets by casting off unethical professionals, professionals and flooding towards those with better standards. Or they can drive, drive a race to the bottom of professional st standards as the least ethical professionals sell out to the highest bidder. I'm an optimist on that. Uh, I've found in my experience that uh, serious corporations are generally conscious of their ethical obligations and whilst they might sometimes uh, tend to want to ignore them, once they're drawn to their attention, they will comply with them. Um, in John Morgan and Pamela Hanrahan's article, professional indemnity insurance is, cite, is considered as a regulative force. The authors demonstrate how PI insurance can act both as a market corrective via feedback steps, but also a way of creating model, moral hazard. Um, one of the interesting things when I was president of the bar was when the professional standards schemes came into operation, whether and to what extent that would limit the regulatory force of uh, those matters, that people advising on issues beyond their competence um, and sometimes, I regret to say, without regard to their responsibilities, were protected by these schemes. And I think that's a problem with PI insurance being a regulatory force, uh, John and Pamela, but I'll be interested in knowing your views on it. In Hughes Brakey and Charles Sampson's second article, they demonstrate how external regulation in the form of a national exam might stymie positive trends in the financial advice market, such as a demand for greater self-regulation. Now, one consequence perhaps of increased what I'll call client centrism is the subjugation of the profession's public service function. A theme that permeates many, many of the papers in this issue is, relations, is the relationship between the professions and the state. For instance, in Dimity and Thomas Clark's and Justine's article, the absence of a public service purpose is cited as one limitation holding the banking industry back from rec recognition as a fully fledged legal profession. <coughs> the banking industry, of course, includes financial advisors. Uh, whether or not financial advisors consider themselves as a profession uh, may be an issue, a matter I don't really want to go to tonight. Uh, whether they behave as a profession is certainly something I don't want to go to, but <laughs> it, 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 really do, it really does highlight the issue of uh, professional responsibility. Uh, a field of legal advice that I think really highlights this difficulty is the tension between 
of the tension between the duty to the client and what I'll call a public service duty is the field of tax advice. Now, we have come a long way, I think, since what Lord Tomlin said in the Duke of Westminster case. Uh, every man is entitled, and all tax lawyers know it, it's ingrained in them from birth. Every man is entitled, if he can, to arrange his affairs so that the tax they're attaching under the appropriate acts is less than it otherwise would be. If he succeeds in ordering them so as to secure that result, then however unappreciative, unappreciative the Commission of Inland Revenue or his fellow taxpayers may be of his ingenuity, he cannot be compelled to pay an increased tax. And that approach flourished in this country, at least until the 1970s, and spawned what might be described as a tax avoidance industry. Now, <coughs> Sydney siders now talk about house prices. Let me assure you, in those days, they talked about their Gorton schemes, their current schemes, or their substance schemes. Um, it really was only when a Royal Commission, which was set up by the then Liberal government into the Painters, Painters and Dockers Union, unexpectedly, and it was quite unexpected, discovered the extent of actual illegal tax evasion that was going on in this country, that attitudes, I think, to some extent changed. But while the Duke of Westminster succeeded in subverting the spirit of the law or maintaining the letter of the law, we now, of course, recognise the matter of statutory interpretation. Uh, legislative is to be interpreted purposefully, where regard is to be had to both, for want of better expressions, form and substance. Nevertheless, does, and I just ask, pose these questions. Does a duty still remain to advise a client how they can avoid, as far as possible, making what the government regards as a proper contribution? Now, there's a fine equilibrium to maintain, be maintained in the interpretation of tax legislation. On the one hand, if the pendulum swings too far in favour of a client-centred approach, where the lawyer actively seeks construction of the law that serves the client and exploits provisions that advance the client's interest in the face of the spirit of the law, uh, they may be caught by anti-avoidance provisions, but for the purpose of uh, this article, is what they are doing appropriate. Now, I talked about what Lord Tomlin said, but uh, shortly thereafter, on the topic of tax planning, Viscount Simon the Pie, there is of course no doubt that tax planners are within, within their legal rights, but that is no reason why their eth efforts should be regarded as a commendable exercise of ingenuity or a discharge of the duties of good citizenship. However, does this moral condemnation of tax planning with its associated priority, I think you'd have to say, of duty to the public, have a place in client tax advice. Does a lawyer who declines to advise on tax minimisation because they are morally opposed to it, breach their duties to a client? Um, Alan Myers QC, an old and good friend of mine, I might say, described in his spirit of defence of tax planning advice, there is a distinction between professional ethics and personal morality. He said it in this way, if a person has strong feelings about the immoral, immorality of a particular law or a particular conduct, then he should try to alter the law. But it undermines the rule of law if he attempts to inhibit or prevent the citizen receiving advice about the law by fettering the advisor with so-called ethical rules. Now, for barristers, believe it or not, the dilemma is particularly acute. Uh, it's compounded by the Cabaret rule which prevents barristers from declining a brief solely on the basis of inconsistent personal views on the subject matter. Is that right in this circumstances or not? Um, I'll let you to ponder it without trying to give an answer. Uh, the interpretive approach that is required of tax lawyers is one that has been described as seeking to uphold the public legislative excess will while promoting the best outcome for the clients within those admittedly hazy boundaries as perhaps a more conservative lawyer, I'd rather describe it as interpreting the legislation, having regard to the accepted principles of interpretation, which I'm pleased to see the university are teaching more and more these days. Um, but it's a fine line to work, or to walk, particularly when the legal subject matter is one that is liable to legitimate interpretive disagreement and, of course, frequent legislative amendment. Uh, there's two tax acts, and uh, I'm not strong enough these days to carry both of them around with me. But, Often, aggressive client centrism in such settings 
is justified by a depiction of the might of the state wielded against the limited resources of the individual. But as with many of our ethical precepts, this picture requires modifying in the case of sophisticated and commercially uh, powerful corporate clients. As Rogers, Kingston, Smith and Cheller were not acknowledged in their paper, most of the safeguards within traditional self-regulation assume the vulnerability of the client. When faced with a sophisticated commercial client, the informational asymmetry, which has historically typified the relationship between lawyers and client, can in fact be tipped in reverse. One example of informational asymmetry that leaves the lawyer in a vulnerable position is when a client asks for advice on the basis of prof profit assumptions or sanitised facts. Often in such a scenario, the client is withholding information in order to elicit a particular response. Now, this narrow compass can be in the interest of a lawyer who can claim ignorance of any unscrupulous person. But that's hardly a satisfying ethical position. While it is obvious that willful blindness is reprehensible, and indeed may not save a lawyer from liability, on the other end of the spectrum, how far should a lawyer have to interrogate provided facts before giving advice where in circumstance there are no obvious alarm bells? Now, one thing I had a number of occasions, people will come to me for advice of whether their um, uh, proposed structure or proposed, proposed arrangement would infringe the uh, anti-competitive provisions of what was then the Trade Practices Act and now, of course, the Competition and Consumer Act. You get a set of facts and it would only admit of one answer, which was the answer the client would want. Uh, what do you do? Um, you can't say that you're instructing solicitors a party to a fraud or a deception. Uh, I worked out an answer, which I used to give, uh, on the basis of these assumed set of facts, it's self-obvious what the answer is. Um, the obviousness of the answer makes one doubt the, the validity of the facts. <laughs> and, and, uh, people would come to me and say, will you take it out? And I said, no. <laughs> Maybe that's why I took a judicial career in the, in the end of some 35 years. But really, it did happen a lot. And it wasn't helpful to the lawyer and it wasn't helpful to the client. I hate to add, neither this firm nor any of the two firms for the previous spons sponsors were ever responsible for that type of conduct. But as lawyers' clients become more sophisticated, and as the corporate action in which they're asked to implicate themselves increases in complexity, the ways of breaching ethical duties escalates in proportion. Uh, much of our just practical advice, probably not lounging, may have fallen into irrelevance. The following preferatory appeal remains pertinent. It behoves a practitioner to take thought of ethical questions in the time of quiet, where they can be regarded as abstract, abstract propositions to be decided impartially, without the rights of an injured party, client, of an injured client to warp judgment or temper it with pity. And that is what I think this issue of the journal achieves. It's an important moment to reflect and promote discussion amongst academics and practitioners alike, and indeed judges them for that matter, on the changing contours of professionalism and the ways in which we as a profession should adapt to best deal with the ethical conundrums many of us face on a daily basis. Thank you.